Some of you may not be aware of this, but America actually has two Independence Days. One celebrates America's freedoms from Britain's rule. Another holiday, Juneteenth, commemorates the day when a Union general came into Texas and gave an order that actually ended slavery. Now, you may be going to yourself like, wait, did an Emancipation Proclamation take care of that? And my answer to you is this. You actually thought the Confederate States obeyed the law. Okay, sure. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln declared all slaves held in Confederate states to be freed. But that news never reached the Texas slaves and there's many theories as to why. Maybe someone literally murdered the messenger that was sent to Texas to inform them. Maybe in typical Confederate fashion, they withheld them information from the slaves. Some historians believe that since the Civil War wasn't over yet, that the lack of Union Army presence in Texas made it hard for Lincoln's proclamation to be enforced. Nonetheless, it was cotton picking business as usual in Texas despite the proclamation. Some slave owners in neighboring states moved their slaves to Texas because they thought that the Confederate Army would eventually win the war, and when it was over, they could get their property back. So when Union General Gordon Granger rode into Galveston, Texas with Union soldiers behind him, and he saw all of these slaves, he decided to make an announcement on June 19, 1865. First off, a proclamation was made from the president to free all these slaves two and a half years ago. Second off, you are no longer slave owners and slaves, you are employers, and those are your hired workers. Some slaves dipped out of there before Granger could even finish his announcement. Other slaves decided to go and leave the state so that they could repair their families that were torn apart from the slave trade. Others decided to flee up north, and they lived happily ever after, right? No, of course not. By law, they were free men and women, but in reality, they were enslaved by oppression and violence. Black bodies still hung from the branches. Some were even shot for their freedom. But freed men and women wanted to celebrate that they were just that, freed. They created a holiday that was originally called June the 19th, but then it was kind of squeezed together and now it's Juneteenth. When they wanted to celebrate the first annual Juneteenth, segregation laws forbade them from using public spaces. Okay, that's fine. We'll celebrate near rivers and lakes. They dressed in the fanciest clothes so they can combat laws that required them to wear raggedy clothing. They ate barbecues, sung spirituals, preached religious sermons. Strawberry soda was the drink of choice, and they also ate a lot of red fruits and desserts like strawberry pie and red velvet cake to commemorate the blood that was spilt during slavery. These rituals still occur in today's Juneteenth celebrations, whether it be parades, cookouts, or five-day festivals. And since whites didn't want to share their own spaces with blacks, the blacks decided that they would raise their own funds for their own celebration sites, such as Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas. So as the former Texas slaves decided to migrate across the country, so did the importance of Juneteenth, which is also known as Emancipation Day or Freedom Day. In 1980, Texas was the first state to declare Juneteenth a state holiday when state offices are not closed, but partially staffed. So far, 45 states have recognized the historical significance of Juneteenth. Guess what? Alabama wasn't last this time. Alabama was the 40th state to do so, but it didn't get the same paid state holiday status as Confederate Memorial Day or Robert E. Lee Day. There's also a national campaign to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. Whitewashed textbooks didn't, and still don't, mention Juneteenth. Because of that, a lot of people are still finding out about Juneteenth. So whether you found out about Juneteenth decades ago, a few weeks ago, or even just now, don't worry. There'll be plenty of cookouts, parades, and festivals to celebrate the resiliency of the black community. I'm Star Dunnigan with Reckon.
Each month, Northwest shares 50% of the plate collections to a local 501c3 organization. In June, our plate collection is shared with Michigan Voices, a backbone organization that helps build civic engagement capacity in progressive nonprofit groups led by and engaging BIPOC people. Michigan Voices provides resources to help nonprofit organizations um, that are in that engage and are led by BIPOC people become self-sustaining in their missions that bring social justice to their communities. Um, you can text uh, with your amount uh, plus plate, so that'll be in the um, Zoom, you'll see that in the Zoom, and you can um, also donate online, and if you're here in person, check, checks and cash, of course, can be placed in the collection basket here in the front of the sanctuary. We also are having the congregational meeting um, via Zoom today uh, at one o'clock. And uh, the meeting ID information, you'll find that in email. Uh, it's also, I'm sure, in your um, order of service. We'll be approving the budget for the new fiscal year, voting on members of the Ministerial Search Committee, and providing updates on other important matters. Our nominees to the Minister Search Committee, and we thank these people for being willing to, um, to stand for election to be served. Julie Bodson, Linda Gobeski, Rick Goldberg, Susie Kinnan, Diana Kohler, Karen Queck, Beata Lamparski, Sharia Robinson Lane, Martha Spear, Amanda Spirell, Pete Sutliff, Trina Toko, and Amy Vanson. So each voting member this afternoon will select four nominees to the Minister Search Committee and the votes will be tallied by the board, uh, and then the board, we're having a special meeting tomorrow to select the other three members of the committee um, out of nominees that were not elected, and then that slate, the full slate of seven, will be announced on Tuesday. Okay. So now do we have, do you wanna do the video from Michigan Voices, Ben? Hello, my name is Shanae Watson Whitaker. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Michigan Voices. I am also the facilitator for the Michigan Voices Reproductive Justice Workgroup. Our workgroup consists of groups that are on the front lines. They see what's going on every day. Their constituents are marginalized. Their constituents consist of BIPOC folks, Black women, LGBTQIA, folks, rural people, as well as incarcerated people as well. While we were having these discussions, we decided to come together around a ballot initiative, specifically when the Supreme Court of the United States decided to consider hearing Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. Together, our partners decided to come together around language that was all-encompassing that represented their demographic groups. We decided to pursue this ballot initiative because we wanted to make sure that all people had access to reproductive care. If you look at the ballot initiative language, it is very inclusive. There are three tenets to this. One is access to abortion services. One is postnatal and prenatal care. And it also bans discrimination. We hope you support our ballot initiative. You can visit our website at mireproductivefreedom.org. Thank you. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. That first sentence of the eighth principle we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote, is the same statement that precedes the list of our seven principles in the UUA bylaws. If you simply Google UUA seven principles, that preamble of the principles, and what I would contend is the most important part, is missing. The principles are simply listed without this context of the covenant to affirm and promote. So what we wanna talk about today is, what does it mean to affirm and promote each of our seven principles? How does the eighth principle fit in with and support this covenant, a covenant we implicitly signed when we signed the NWU membership book? 
And now we're gonna have hymn number 1029, Love Knocks and Waits for Us to Hear. The first principle calls us to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So let's dissect this statement, to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The Oxford Dictionary says that the definition of affirm is to state as a fact, to assert strongly and publicly. And that really is the easy part. It's especially easy to declare, I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I would bet you could say that out loud in almost any setting. Thanksgiving dinner with your conservative family, at an NRA meeting, at a Southern Baptist convention, and pretty much everyone would agree with you. But then repeat yourself, I believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Every person. What does that mean? Do we really believe that? Do we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person at that Thanksgiving dinner, the NRA meeting, the Southern Baptist Convention? And then let's take the next step. What does it mean to promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person? What are we actually doing to make that belief a reality? It would require seeing every other person as a person, and we don't always do that we all fall into the trap of demonizing those who are not like us, who don't think like us, don't look like us. I'm not too worried about the NRA members or the Southern Baptists. As groups, they're pretty self-assured of their own inherent worth and dignity and great at promoting it. But who are those in our society whose inherent worth and dignity is constantly undermined by everything from individual interactions to public policy? The eighth principle calls us to accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions. This call is absolutely necessary for the first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, to become a reality. The blight of systemic racism makes the affirmation of the first principle impossible. We cannot affirm, cannot state as a fact, the inherent worth and dignity of every person when our societal and governmental systems continue to oppress others. 
The only way we will ever be able to truly affirm the first principle is by taking action to promote it. And the first step is understanding the implicit biases we all carry, ideas we were taught, grew up with, and have had reinforced again and again. Not just ideas about race, but class, gender, sexuality, abilities, intelligence. As human beings, we constantly ascribe worth and value to others based on a wide variety of factors. Only when we understand what these individual factors are, how and why we learned them, the history that informed them, only then can we begin to promote and one day hope to truly affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Uh, before I begin, I just want to make one slight addition to the video that we saw, which was actually produced before uh, 2021 when Juneteenth was officially uh, recognized as a federal holiday. So I just wanted to put that out there for people. The second principle states justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. There is a clear overlap between the second and eighth principles. The second principle incorporates core components of the eighth principle by calling for justice and equity in human relations. Certainly, justice and equity are key to dismantling racism and other oppressions. Likewise, compassion is important to build a diverse, multicultural, and beloved community. Reverend M Emily Gage states that the second principle points us to one, the larger community, two, collective responsibility, and three, has systemic implications. The eighth principle expands the second principle by urging us to specifically acknowledge racism and other oppressions as barriers to justice and equity and to address those barriers directly. We can begin that process by deepening our understanding of the history and current manifestations of systemic racism in our country. Systemic racism often hides in plain sight in policies and pra practices that disproportionately harm people of color, such as the war on drugs, the bail system, and our lack of universal health care, just to name a few. Once we clearly identify systemic racism, we are in a better position to fight for justice and ex equity for all. We can also live the second and eighth principles by creating opportunities to listen to and learn from different racial groups and cultures. This is the first step toward developing and practicing compassion. We move closer to building a diverse, multicultural beloved community when we actively include the voices and cultural practices of diverse peoples in our worship and congregational life. Here is the third principle. Acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Oh, good. I do see acceptance of one another as an integral part of spiritual growth. Years ago, I was inspired by a book called The Different Drum by Dr. M. Scott Peck. It was all about community building and how community building brings peace. I attended a workshop by Dr. Peck, and one of the major steps to the emergence of community, as it was taught then, within a group of people, is the recognition of the differences that are within the group. Such differences include things like economic status, economic background, age, skin color, sexual orientation, and religion, just as examples of differences. I learned that some differences were harder to see, and some were harder to understand. 
when the group as a whole became aware of differences and began to embrace, accept, and also support the differences, community began to emerge. It was indeed a spiritual growth event for me. I do remember a time uh, in my life when I was coming out and my parents were getting used to it. I was a full adult at the time and actually married for the second time. And uh, my mother wanted uh, dad and uh, herself and me to go to a workshop that worked on developing understanding of the gay community. So dad went, he was very involved and everything like that. At the end of the event, when we were all kind of doing our closing words and things like that, he turned to the group of gay people that were there and he says, you know, I don't see you all as gay. And I just about fell out of my chair. And I thought, uh oh, what did, what did we do wrong here? Because what I really wanted him to see the difference and understand it and accept it. And when I've also gone through my life, I will also discovered I've made the same mistake as my father. It really is important to see the differences, be able to know what they are and to accept them. The eighth principle helps us bring this third principle alive by turning this acceptance and encouragement into, into a journey that calls us into action to be aware of differences and then move to acceptance and also support those differences. These are important steps to help dismantle racism and other oppressions. When we all embrace these principles within our congregation, we will individually and congregationally grow spiritually and begin to usher in a diverse, multicultural, beloved community, which will help bring justice into the larger community and our world. Oh, um, we are going to hear a, a see and hear a video of Keep Loving, a universal love song. Whether you're different, same ignorant or intelligent Whether you tell the truth, lie or embellish it Whether you live in gratitude or for the hell of it It doesn't really matter, we're still one single fellowship Whether you've been lustful or living celibate Whether you're an optimist or only see the negative Whether you're dead, broke or rich from inheritance it Doesn't really matter, we're made of the same sediment Whether you got a family or single parenting Or you're Asian, African, European or American Whether you pray to God or atheist is irrelevant Cause what you got inside is the same as all your Troubled in the homeless Can you say everywhere you are Is where your home is Sharing your heart in the dark Just like a lotus Letting your light shine bright So you can flow this Everlasting love of grace Like those did Jesus, Muhammad, Krishna, Buddha and Moses Who carried the weight of the world Upon their shoulders So every time you fall down Go ahead and hold this Close to your heart Cause you're a love soldier And every time you get a chance You pay it forward Moving closer to heaven's gates We're all soaring Because of you Love is where we're so headed towards It'll change your heart, it'll change your mind And then you start to change so your love Everything you touch, everyone you see Will soon become your
mind, gotta keep on caring, gotta keep the light on through dark and despair, gotta spread the love where nobody cares, gotta keep on loving, gotta keep on sharing, gotta keep on trying, gotta keep on caring, gotta keep the light on through dark and despair. We're on to the fourth principle now, and this section was put together by Vanessa Washington, who was not able to be here today, so these are Vanessa's uh, sharings. The fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Gina Hastings from the Spirit of Life Unitarian Fellowship in Sydney states, with this right of personal spiritual exploration comes an enormous responsibility. We are responsible for thinking through what we know, hear, read, and decide on. We are dedicated to thinking through carefully what we believe using not only logic and reason, but also intuition and compassion that comes from our inner soul. This requires constant self-honesty with ourselves and with others. It takes time. It requires courage. For example, does one speak up at work about an injustice to a coworker, even if it threatens our own job? Do we stand up to bullies rather than take a peaceful road of complacency? Do we speak out at union meetings when we feel our union bosses are speaking for their own power rather than for the needs of the workers? A free and responsible search for meaning means living what is meaningful. It is not simply an intellectual exercise. It takes enormous courage. And that's the end of the quote. Do we actively work to dismantle racism and other impressions as we aspire to in the eighth principle? Ms. Hastings goes on to say, in our congregations, we also need to learn from one another. If what you learn, what I learn from our different experiences shared, it makes us both richer. Each different, carefully studied belief or idea held by a member of our congregation adds to the fabric and strength of our Unitarian cloth and of each other. It's what makes us unified in diversity. If our congregations are homogeneous and we do not build a diverse, multi multicultural, beloved community as we aspire to with the Eighth Principle, we limit the learning and meaning we gain from interaction and shared experiences with members of our congregation. Good morning, I'm Trina, uh, and I'm doing the fifth principle, which is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregation and in society at large. And as you can see, we always operate as a democratic group that travels together. Um, or I also like, I, I looked up what the kids version is um, and, it believe, and it says we believe that all persons should have a vote about things that concern them. Um, in my day-to-day -day work as the director of the Michigan Education Justice Coalition, I see this so deeply felt and fought for by, by black and brown led community organizations across Michigan. We even have shirts that say, nothing about us without us. In just a couple of hours, our own congregation will use a formal voting process yeah, right. to get us one step closer to a settled minister. It is this principle that ensures we are more than do-gooders or offering charity, but rather we work intentionally to be inclusive of those impacted to ensure they have a voice and lead. I'd like to think this principle also calls us to vote with our dollars. Um, and perhaps another, of, another component of this principle is to spend our cash in BIPOC and minority-owned businesses, 
especially given I, I'm sure many of you are getting all the text messages that I've been um, about the, say, the Juneteenth sales um, for today and tomorrow. And I was in tomorrow. <laughs> The sixth principle states, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Reverend Sean Parker Dennison states that the sixth principle seems extravagant in its hopefulness and improbable in its prospects. I agree. The world seems so far from this vision when we see evidence of hatred, cynicism, and cruelty daily. Reverend Dennison goes on to say, as naive and impossible as the sixth principle may seem, I'm not willing to give it up. And in the face of our culture's apathy and fear, I want to imagine and help create a powerful vision of peace by peaceful means, liberty by liberatory, liberatory means, justice by just means. The sixth principle urges us to maintain hope for a better world. The eighth principle further defines that hope as journeying towards spiritual wholeness. But hope is not enough. We are called to action to make the vision a reality. Dismantling racism and other oppressions leads to a world with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Creating a beloved community in our lives and our congregation is a first step toward this vision. We are called to continue the good fight by the sixth principle. Um, so the next one is the seventh principle. Uh, this section was put together by Vanessa Washington, who could not be here today. Revan Forrest Gilmore, Executive Director of Shalom Community Center in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, reflects that our eighth principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence, is a glorious statement. Yes, yet we make a profound mistake when we limit it to merely an environmental idea. It is so much more. Oh, and I didn't read the seventh principle, sorry. So the seventh principle is respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Uh, and then, uh, so Gina Hastings, which is an excerpt from the seven, the seven principles, my reflections from January, 2010. This principle, the most recently added is sometimes viewed in a narrower focus than perhaps was meant. Some Unitarians are pantheists. This is where their understanding of this principle stops. Others boil it down to scrupulous recycling of their waste or buying or even voting green. It requires us to change, grow, and think differently for the sake of the interdependent web of life that we are a part of. It propels us to work to create a society of compassion, harmony, and justice with courage now and with hope in the future, in the future of our descendants, end quote. To respect the interdependent web of all existence means respecting and recognizing that you are dependent upon people who do not look like you or think like you, or worship like you. It is impossible to fully embody this principle without working to create a congregation in a world that acknowledges our interdependence with all of life, including all of the people, those who are suppressed by white supremacy and racism, and those who benefit from white supremacy and racism. Our next hymn is hymn number 168, one more step.
words from Michael Eric Dyson. My dear friends, please try to understand that whiteness is limitless possibility. It is universal and invisible. That's why many are offended by any reference to race. You believe you are acting and thinking neutrally, objectively, without preference for one group or the next, including your own. You see yourselves as colorless until black folk dump the garbage of race on your heads. At your best moments, you may concede that you started the race game, but you swear to the God you love that it is we black folk who keep it going. You have no idea how absurd that notion is, and yet we have grown accustomed to your defiance of common sense. So during the postlude, we have a video. Um, at the last minute, I decided to try to put together a Father's Day video. So our transitions team had pulled together a lot of really great old photos from the 60s and the 70s, which I thought some of our longer term members would enjoy. Although I admit it sort of looks like a retrospective on Frank Gentile's haircuts. So <laughs> a, uh, a couple decades are missing. And then some folks I reached out to sent me some family pictures and Ariana Abel sent me some of the photos that she'd gathered for Kimmy's and Jan's retirement events. So I hope you enjoy it and that someone can tell us 21st century members who some of these folks are. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, grandfathers and father figures in our lives. <laughs> 